In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, Amen. I'd like to welcome you all to our Perseverance Family Conversation. And as always, it's great to be with all of you. As we enter to this fifth Sunday in the Lenten season, one week away from Holy Week and two weeks away from the celebration of Easter, which is the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ from the dead, who came to give us life in life in abundance. So as always, we'd like to begin our conversation by inviting Mary to be with us. Mary is the mother of God. Mary is the mother of the church. Mary is the mother of each and every one of us. So I'd like to invite Mary to be with us and pray the prayer that she loves most. That prayer is, of course, the Hail Mary. Together. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for our sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. My friends, let's uh, now invite our spiritual director to be with us. Our spiritual director is the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit has uh, many titles. He's known as the Paraclete. The Catechism of the Catholic Church calls the Holy Spirit the gift of gifts. The sequence that we pray in Pentecost we pray the Holy Spirit as the sweet guest of our souls. And then we pray to the Holy Spirit also as our counselor. He's also our consoler. The Holy Spirit is also the interior master. St. Paul reminds us that we really don't know how to pray as we ought. But good news. It's the Holy Spirit that intercedes with ineffable groans so that we can cry out, Abba. Abba, which means Daddy or Father. So let's uh, invite the Holy Spirit to be with us to give us a lot of light in our mind, light in our intellect. As well as, let's beg the Holy Spirit to give us that interior fire of love. To set our hearts on fire with the love for God and all those things that refer to God. As we pray, come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and enkindle within us the fire of your divine love. Send forth your spirit, and they shall be created. And thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who did instruct the hearts of your faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant us by the same Spirit we may be truly wise, And ever rejoice in his consolation to the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Our Lady Guadalupe, pray for us. St. Joseph, pray for us. St. Michael the Archangel, pray for us. St. Gabriel, Pray for us. Saint Raphael, pray for us. Saint Ignatius of Loyola, pray for us. Saint Maria Faustina Kowalska, pray for us. All God's angels and saints, 
Pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So we welcome you all to our Perseverance family. And this is our custom after we pray together, because the family that prays together stays together. We move on to the prayer that I would like to offer for all of you. As always, as is my custom, promise to pray for all of you as we draw closer to Holy Week, which is next Sunday, and then Easter two weeks from today. I'd like to place you on the altar in the Mass and offer these specific intentions. My first intention to pray that all of us will try to live out these next two weeks in our spiritual life with great generosity. St. Ignatius in the spiritual exercises uses the word magnanimity, magna anima. Magna, great anima, soul, great soulness, great generosity with God. So let's pray that we be magnanimous, generous with the Lord in these two weeks before we celebrate the glorious feast day of his resurrection from the dead. My next intention will be, I'd like to pray in a special way for your families. That all of your families would try with great generosity in these two weeks to get closer to God. There may be some of your family members who have been drift, drifted away from God that they would, let's pray for them, that they'll make good confessions in these two weeks. Cleanse their souls from sin and to return to God with all their heart, as the prophet reminds us. And that your children and your family members recognize that the major obstacle in our spiritual life the major obstacle in achieving true happiness because we all want to be happy in this life as well as in the life to come is related to the reality of sin. The last words that Jesus says in the Gospel in John chapter 8 to the woman caught in adultery, is Jesus says, I do not condemn you, but go and sin no more. Those are the words of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to this woman caught in adultery. My third intention will be for world peace. Especially in the Ukraine, all of us are are worried about that, but we should more than worry, we should pray about it that through Mary's prayers there will be a divine intervention and that there will be peace. World peace. As Father Patrick Payton reminds us, the family that prays together stays together. And a world at prayer is a world at peace. I'd like to ask you 
to pray for another intention. And it's the following. That all of you would pray in a special way for this coming Saturday will be the day in which the bishop comes to the parish to confirm our young people. So there'll be two masses next Saturday. The bishop will come to confirm the young people. A hundred in total, two masses of about 50. Pray that they will be well prepared to receive this wonderful sacrament. Sacrament in which they are called to be soldiers of Christ. And in the ritual prayer of confirmation, they're called to both to defend the faith and to spread the faith. They're called to allow these gifts of the Holy Spirit to grow and flourish and blossom and overflow in their relationship with others. And those seven gifts of the Holy Spirit that we should all know and try to cultivate in, their own, in our own lives are, what are they? Wisdom, knowledge, understanding, counsel, fortitude, piety, fear of the Lord. Those are the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit that we're receiving baptism, but confirmation is a time in which they're fortified all the more. So I ask you to pray for all of them. So let's go into our readings for the day as we draw closer and closer to Holy Week, which will be next, next Sunday. So we have three readings, as is always the case, on Sunday. The Vatican, Second Vatican Council, in the documents, on the liturgy, Sacrosanta Concilium says that every time we go to Mass, we have the privilege of nourishing ourselves from two tables. The first is the table of the Word of God. The Word of God. We always start off Lent where Jesus is fasting in the desert for 40 days and 40 nights. And he's hungry. And the devil tells Jesus to turn stones into bread. Jesus says, Man does not live on bread alone, but every word that comes forth from the mouth of God. In the second table, so we nourish ourselves on the word of God, three readings in the psalm in the Sunday Mass. Then we nourish ourselves on the bread of life which is the Eucharist. When I was studying in Rome, Father Jordan Allman said that for the Protestants, the center of their celebration is the pulpit. Whereas for us as Catholic, you have the pulpit, but also the altar. So we want to nourish ourselves on the Word of God, but also the bread of life. A suggestion as you get closer and closer to Holy Week.
yesterday, in the afternoon, I had a retreat for the First Communion children, as well as a retreat for the parents of the First Communion children. In this retreat, I gave the parents a talk on the First Commandment. Then they were able to break into groups and talk about this. Then me and another priest, we spent a couple hours hearing confessions of the parents. During the time of the confession, the children came in with the parents to view a movie which came out about 10 years ago. And I'd invite all of you to see this movie with your family. It I think is probably about the best movie that's ever been composed on the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. There have been documentaries, talks, conferences on the Mass, many, many, and many are good. But this movie, it's called, if you want to see it in Spanish, because some of you are bilingual, it's called El Gran Milagro. El Gran Milagro. In English, this movie would be The Greatest Miracle. And this greatest miracle is very much related to what we're talking about today in the readings of the Mass. It's a movie that shows three individuals in the very beginning of the Mass with very serious problems. The bus driver has his son dying of cancer. There's a young widow who's struggling with her son. An older widow that's suffering from loneliness. Three of them are battling with these three different problems. And they're experiencing sadness at the beginning of the film. In the film, they experience great joy because the film centers on the guardian angels that bring them into church in which the guardian angel sitting next to them explains every different part of the Mass. Every different part of the Mass. And really, the Mass is leading toward the crescendo, the climax, which is consecration and communion. Consecration and communion. And when the priest lifts up the host, you can see Jesus in the host. When the priest is absolving sin, you see the priest turns into Christ himself. So, my friends, as we explain the Word of God, we hope and pray that you will see that movie and appreciate all the more the greatest miracle. The greatest miracle, which is the holy sacrifice of the Mass. That you would nourish yourself 
on the Word of God. That's what we're doing every morning. But we're, but you would nourish yourself also on the Eucharistic banquet, the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus present in every in every consecrated host. All right. The first reading is taken from Isaiah chapter 43. And the essence of this reading is God will come to help to transform our lives. He will transform our desert and make a way. In the wastelands there will be rivers. Wild beasts, enemy jackals and ostriches. For I put water in the desert and rivers in the wasteland for my chosen people to drink. So basically turning deserts where there's no water and into water that will be present to drink. I'd like to give you three biblical passages that are parallel to this whole idea of water and drinking and how we can apply this to our lives. And they're the following. Because the essence of this is, see, I am doing something new and I give my people drink. First is taken from Psalm 42, verse 1. And that is, as the deer, my friends, as the deer yearns for the running streams, so my soul yearns for you, O Lord, my God. As the deer yearns for the running streams, so my soul yearns for you, O Lord, my God. Second verse is taken from John chapter 4. It's the woman at the well seeking water. Jesus meets this Samaritan woman at the well at about midday. Jesus is tired and thirsty. And Jesus says to this woman at the well, woman, give me to drink. The third verse I'd like to give to you is John chapter 19. Jesus hanging on the cross, about to give out this spirit, says, I thirst. Those are three verses in the Bible, and we have the fourth in Isaiah which refer to water, drink, and thirst. That's right. Water, drink, and thirst. In the Catechism of the Catholic Church, there's a quotation from the great St. Augustine. And he says in the part on prayer, God hungers that we hunger for him. And God thirsts that we thirst for him. One last verse. So I'm giving you five parallel biblical verses that all refer to 
hunger, thirst, drink, water. In this John chapter 6, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Whoever eats my body and drinks my blood will have everlasting life. And I will raise him up on the last day. Whoever eats my body and drinks my blood will have everlasting life and I will raise him up on the last day. So the point, God hungers and thirsts for you. I repeat, God hungers and thirsts for you and for your love. But God also wants you to love him in return. It's a two-way street. God always loves us, but he wants us to love him back. My friends, how do we show that we love someone? In the United States, often it's by buying gifts and giving a material gift, which is fine. But another way in which we can show we care for someone, we love that person, is to give that person time. The financial experts say time is money. I would say time is a manifestation of our love for the person. It's a manifestation of our love for the person. We love a person, then we, we should be willing to dedicate our time for that person. So my friends, give time to God. Give God an hour. Your holy hour, not your happy hour, your holy hour. Give God time. And he'll give you eternal happiness. So true. I repeat, give God time. And he'll give you eternal happiness in heaven. You give God an hour every day, then he's going to bless the other 23 hours. Then if you give God time, then you want to make sure that you give your family members time also. Not time out, but time in. Not time out, but time in. So my friends, that's the first reading related to water and thirst and hunger on a natural level. And we want to try to let, raise it to the supernatural level that God hungers and thirsts for us but he wants to, us to hunger and thirst for him. One last quote from the great St. Augustine, who was hunger and thirsting and slaking his thirst on sexuality. After his conversion, St. Augustine pens the first autobiography called Confessions, in which he says, O oh Lord, you have made our hearts for thee, and our hearts are restless until they rest in thee. So that's the first reading. From Isaiah. Psalm 126, the antiphon is, The Lord has done great things for us. We are filled with joy. The Lord has done great things for us, and we are filled with joy. Okay, my friends, I'm going to invite all of you, related to that psalm, 
call to mind today three great things that God has done for you. And in prayer, thank God for that. I repeat, call to mind three great things that God has done for you and thank God for that. I'll give you an example. I'm eternally grateful for the fact that I was baptized. I celebrated my baptism anniversary on the day that the Pope consecrated Russia and the Ukraine to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. I happened to be baptized on March 25th. What a blessing. So a double thanks to God for my baptism, but I was baptized on the Annunciation to Mary. What a, what a beautiful day to be baptized. Second, I'd like to, I'd like to thank God for my parents and, have it, and having had a good family upbringing. I'm thankful for that. And the third, even though I'm not worthy, I'm thankful to God that he called me to become a Catholic priest. I'm thankful. Right now, with all of you, I'm thanking God for my baptism, my family, and my vocation to the priesthood. I thank God right now. Thank God. Constantly, we should be thanking God. Now, I'll tell you what is especially difficult. When we're going through tough times, we're going through desolation. Even though this is difficult, we have to practice the agite contra to go against the grain. When we're in desolation, we should pull back and make that triple act of thanksgiving. You might be surprised by rendering thanks to God, God can pull you out. He can pull you out of that pit of desolation. If you'd like to move now, my friends, into the second reading. The second reading, we have a letter of St. Paul to the Philippians. One occasion, a, uh, a lector made a mistake and said, a letter of Paul to the Filipinos. Now they read a letter of St. Paul to the theologians. not the Philippians or the theologians, it's the Philippians and the Thessalonians. But the essence of the reading of St. Paul to the Philippians today is St. Paul is saying that everything is considered as rubbish or trash or useless, except one thing, except one thing, getting to know and to love our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's right. St. Paul considers everything as rubbish, garbage, refuse, trash, everything. Everything, except one, getting to know and to love and to be possessed and to possess our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Nothing more important than that.
Nothing more important than that. Very simple lady, last Tuesday after I gave my talk on the spiritual exercises on the public life of Christ, the Luminous Mysteries. Came up to me after I was just going through the Luminous Mysteries, which is the public life of Christ. Baptism, the wedding feast of Cana, proclamation of the kingdom, transfiguration, and then the institution of the Eucharist. She asked me, Father, how, how can I, what are some sources to get to know Christ better? And I thought, great question. Very much related to the reading today where St. Paul says, I, call, I, I count everything as a loss, as refuse, as garbage, except knowing and loving Christ. So she came up and asked me a very simple but very important question. And um, I'm often dealing with hundreds of people when I'm giving conferences and talks And I told her, um, you know, in the Bible, that's where we will encounter God. But especially if we want to really get to know Christ in a deep and dynamic way, get to know Christ, it's in the Bible, yes. But the heart of the Bible, my friends, is we've got 73 books in the Bible, 46 books in the Old Testament, 27 in the New Testament. The very heart of the, of the Bible are the Gospels. And this very simple woman was not aware of that. And I said, well, you know, go, you have a Bible? Yes, Father. Well, go to your Bible. In the New Testament, you're going to encounter Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. That's right. By reading Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you're going to get to know, as St. Paul says, the excelling knowledge and love of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Paul speaks about possessing Christ and allowing Christ to possess us. That's what we want. We want to be possessed by Christ. That's our desire. People will sometimes come up to me also, Father, the Bible. Yes, what about the Bible? Well, should I read the Bible? Of course read the Bible. Well, if, we're going to read the, if I'm going to read the Bible, where should I start? Now, many believe it's best to start just in the Old Testament and read from the Old Testament all the way to the book of the Apocalypse. I don't think that that's the wisest thing to do. You can do it that way. You're free. But I think the best way to start off is start by reading the Gospels. That's right. I heard a commentary on this topic that said, re first read the Gospels, and then read the Gospels, then read the Gospels. So he insisted that you read the gospel three times before then you move into the Acts of the Apostles and the letters of St. Paul, then the Catholic letters, reading first the New Testament. So, getting to know our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Bible, and then a good Bible commentary. There are many. And if you ask me, I would suggest, um, it came out a few years ago, and uh, I have it in my library. It's called the Didache Bible. It's called the Didache Bible. Why do I recommend the Didache Bible? It's published, I think, by Ignatius Press. Because 
the whole of the Bible below is explained. The explanation of the Bible comes from the Catechism of the Catholic Church. And they say over the last 50 years, the greatest writing of John Paul II, and he wrote a lot. John Paul II wrote a lot. Encyclicals, apostolic exhortations, apostolic letters, many writings. The Code of Canon Law, the New Code of Canon Law, many writings. However, his Obra Maestra, his masterpiece, would be in the early 90s, he published the Catechism of the Catholic Church. That's right. The Catechism of the Catholic Church. Now, the Catechism of the Catholic Church, my friends, is a spiritual catechetical masterpiece. So the Dedicate Bible, my friends, the Dedicate Bible has the whole Bible, but below the footnotes are a comment on the biblical passage from in the light of the Catechism of the Catholic Church, which is superb. Superb. So, one last idea on the writing of St. Paul to, his, to the Philippians. And I repeat, the essence of this reading is very beautiful. St. Paul says that he considers everything as a loss because of the supreme knowing of Christ Jesus my Lord. And he actually says everything in compar everything in comparison with Jesus is rubbish. Rubbish, which means garbage, trash. So I'd like to make an Ignatian commentary on this. In the spiritual exercise of Saint Ignatius. the month retreat, the very heart of the spiritual exercise of St. Ignatius is the life of Christ. In the four weeks, the four, first week would be on sin, the third week the passion of Christ, the fourth week the resurrection of Christ, the second week of the exercises, St. Ignatius wants us to focus on the person of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So much so that he would recommend usually 11 to 12 days of the month retreat. So the second week is not chronologically seven days, but often 11 days. Where St. Ignatius insists that we meditate and contemplate, we meditate and we contemplate one person. And that person is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Which is the essence of the, read, the, the, the reading of St. Paul to the Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3 is very Christological. Christ is the center, the centerpiece of Philippians chapter 3. Now Ignatius in the exercises says that we should be begging for this specific grace, this specific grace, all related to Jesus Christ. 
it says that we should beg for intimate knowledge of Jesus. Intimate, intimate knowledge of Jesus. As St. Paul says in Philippians. And then he says, intimate knowledge of Jesus, that, that I love him more ardently. And I follow him more closely. So see, there's a, a sequence. There's a dynamism there. There's those three, those three verbs, all related to Jesus Christ. The three verbs, infinitives, would be to know Jesus Christ, to love Jesus Christ, and to follow Jesus Christ. To know Jesus Christ, to love Jesus Christ, to follow Jesus Christ. Knowledge generates love. Knowledge generates love. And love generates a desire to follow. And I would add two more to the Ignatian equation. is knowledge generates love, love generates following, following generates imitation. We want to imitate our lover, Christ. And the end result of knowing Christ, loving Christ, following Christ, imitating Christ is transformation. Such that St. Paul will, will be able to say, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. The transformation, the Christification, the metamorphosis of ourselves in which we're becoming like our lover, and that lover is Christ the Lord. So as we get closer to Holy Week next week, Let's beg for that grace. It's a wonderful chapter that we really like St. Paul. Everything is rubbish. Everything is trash. It's not related to knowing Christ and loving Christ and allowing Christ to possess us and we possess Christ. And that's exactly what I said a half hour ago. When we receive Holy Communion, we possess Christ and Christ possesses us. That's the secret. We are possessed by Christ, and Christ possesses us when we receive Holy Communion. Because Holy Communion is Christ himself. All right, my friends. That being the case, let's move into the Gospel for today. The Gospel for today is taken from the Gospel of St. John chapter 8, verse 1 through 11. And I'll summarize it in my own words, and then we'll pull out maybe two or three lessons that God wants to lay in our hearts. So we see Jesus, Jesus goes to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus gets up very early. Often we see Jesus getting up very early in prayer. And then he goes to the temple. He goes to the temple of Jerusalem. Where you have the majestic temple that was built by King Solomon. So then the temple, the people... They gather around Jesus. He's like a magnet. He attracts these people. And then he teaches them. We see Jesus teaching and teaching and teaching at great length. 
is I'm trying to deal with you people too. Jesus is the greatest of all teachers. He's the greatest of all teachers. Teaching at great length. He's teaching. And then something happens. These scribes and Pharisees were always trying to trip Jesus up. They do is they drag in front of Jesus this woman, this woman who was caught in the act of adultery. And they're bringing this woman to Jesus to test Jesus so they can have Jesus condemned. So there's bad will on the part of these people. They're looking for something to have him trip so that they can condemn him to death. And it's a, there's a wonderful presentation of this in the movie of Mel of this woman caught in adultery, John chapter 8. So they say to him, Master, the, the law of Moses says this, A woman that's caught in adultery. A woman that's caught in adultery, according to the law of Moses, points out that this woman should be condemned to death. And how? by that of stoning. So that's the, the presentation of these Pharisees and these scribes. With the purpose to trip Christ up so that then they can have him condemned to death. Now Jesus is going to do something that's extraordinary. He does not respond right away to the Pharisees and the scribes. And what Jesus does is with his finger, gets down on his knees and he's, with his finger, he's writing in the sand. He's writing in the sand. Now, this is very interesting because we have this the only time in any of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, this is the Gospel of John, is the only time, the only time in which we see Jesus writing. So they press Jesus for an answer, and he doesn't respond right away. And then Jesus finally gets up, after having writ writing, writing on the ground, and there are commentaries as to what maybe what he wrote, and I'll tell you what the commentators say about this. Jesus gets up and says, looking at them, 
whoever among you is without sin, whoever among you who is without sin, okay, you can pick up the stone and you can throw it at her. Imagine this scene. Who is that? Whoever is without sin, let him pick up the stone and throw it at this woman. What do we see? In the film, they all drop their stones. And they leave the woman, starting with the elders. Starting with the, the older ones. And there Jesus is alone with this woman. And he says, where are they who have condemned you, woman? Has no one condemned you? And she says, no. And Jesus goes on to say, neither do I, neither do I condemn you. But the last verse of Jesus is very telling. He, he says this. Neither do I condemn you, but go. And from now on, do not sin anymore. Go and from now on, do not sin anymore. So, my friends, it's a beautiful passage. I invite you to read through it and meditate upon it. And I would glean for you two essential messages. Two essential messages for us to meditate upon. First is the infinite mercy and compassion of Jesus for all, especially for, for great sinners. That's right. The infinite, the infinite mercy, compassion, and love that Jesus has for sinners. He came for sinners. But second is, is that Jesus wants us to give up sin. Mercy for sin, but we're called to give up our sin. So as we draw close to Holy Week, let us give up our sin, but trust in the infinite mercy of the heart of Jesus and Mary. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.